J'aimerais tout d'abord revenir sur certains événements like qui ont marqué l'actualité cette semaine. Il y a quelques jours, mon cher collègue Joël Ladan a fait une sortie publique Joel remarquée. D'emblée, je tiens à préciser que j'ai beaucoup d'amitié, beaucoup d'estime et beaucoup d'affection pour mon ami Joël. Nous échangeons régulièrement sur de nombreux enjeux incluant la gestion de la pandémie et j'ai toujours apprécié le ton et la qualité de ses interventions. En démocratie, il est tout à fait sain que tous et que toutes puissent exprimer leurs opinions. Il faut encourager le débat et la discussion. Nous avons tous que les gens ont hâte d'en finir avec la pandémie. Et nous avons effectivement tous et toutes hâte d'en finir. Comme Joël, je l'entends chez moi, à Québec, dans ma circonscription et ici à Ottawa. Nous savons aussi que pour en sortir, nous devons continuer à travailler ensemble dans le respect, dans un esprit de bienveillance, afin d'unir nos forces contre le virus. C'est vrai pour la vaccination et c'est vrai pour l'adhésion à l'ensemble des mesures sanitaires qui sont encore en place. Depuis maintenant deux ans, l'action gouvernementale dans la lutte contre la COVID-19 a été basée sur la prudence et sur la science. Comme vous le savez, la science évolue constamment et comme nous l'avons fait depuis le début de la pandémie, nous allons continuer à baser nos décisions et nos mesures sur les meilleures informations scientifiques disponibles. Les mesures And sanitaires data. actuellement en vigueur sont temporaires. Measures... Certaines seront avec nous pour longtemps, d'autres seront levées dès que la situation épidémiologique, la science et la prudence nous le permettront. Il est important de garder aussi en tête que ces mesures, quelles qu'elles soient, visent à limiter les torts que cause le virus. Toutes les mesures font l'objet d'une réévaluation constante et nous allons continuer à les ajuster en fonction de la science et de la prudence et de l'évolution de la situation épidémiologique. And the evolution Le pire de Micron étant maintenant derrière nous, notre gouvernement évalue d'ailleurs activement les mesures en place à nos frontières et nous devrions être en mesure de communiquer des changements à ce sujet dès la semaine prochaine, avec l'appui, évidemment, et la collaboration de l'équipe de la santé publique de la Dr. Tan. Nous aimerions tous savoir avec certitude ce que nous réserve les prochaines semaines et les prochains mois. Mais après deux ans de pandémie, nous savons que ce virus n'a pas fini de nous surprendre. Nous savons que la question n'est pas de savoir s'il y aura d'autres vagues ou d'autres Variants, Au cours des derniers jours, nous avons entendu plusieurs fois la phrase « Nous avons hâte de vivre avec le virus ». Nous sommes tous d'accord pour dire que nous devons apprendre à vivre le virus. Mais concrètement, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire vivre avec le virus? Permettez-moi de tenter une réponse à cette question de manière un peu professorale à la mesure de mon ancienne vie comme professeur d'économie à l'université Laval. Vivre avec le virus, ça veut d'abord dire qu'il faut que les gens arrêtent d'en mourir en si grand nombre. Deuxièmement, vivre avec le virus, ça veut dire qu'il faut que le virus et notre système de santé puissent coexister sans que ce dernier soit paralysé. Sans que les patients atteints du cancer se fassent dire que leur chirurgie devra attendre parce que nos hôpitaux et nos travailleurs de la santé sont surchargés par la COVID. Troisièmement, vivre avec le virus, ça veut dire qu'il faut collectivement et individuellement optimiser l'utilisation de l'ensemble des outils que nous avons dans notre boîte à outils pour limiter la transmission et limiter la sévérité des infections. Quatrièmement, vivre avec le virus, ça veut aussi dire que l'on ne peut pas être malhonnête. Il faut être lucide et reconnaître qu'il est non seulement possible, mais probable que les prochains mois nous réservent encore de mauvaises surprises. Cinquièmement, vivre avec le virus, c'est reconnaître qu'on ne peut pas vivre sans le virus. Sixièmement, vivre avec le virus, ça veut aussi dire que nous voulons nous rappeler que nous ne sommes pas impuissants devant le virus. Je le répète, nous ne sommes pas impuissants. Nous avons maintenant de nombreux outils pour que les mesures soient moins sévères et perturbent le moins possible notre vie sociale, notre économie et notre vie personnelle. Et notre principal outil, ça demeure encore et toujours 
Même si nous savons que la protection vaccinale est imparfaite, la science est sans équivoque. La vaccination réduit la transmission et prévient les infections sévères. Si nous arrivons à prévenir les complications sévères, nos hôpitaux et nos travailleurs de la santé ne seront plus submergés. Si nos hôpitaux et nos travailleurs de la santé ne sont plus submergés, les mesures sanitaires pourront être moins sévères. Then the healthcare measures don't need to be as strict. That much is obvious, but it's important to remind Canadians that collectively and individually, it's within our power to change things. Living with COVID-19 means that we wield this power to minimise the impact on our daily, everyday lives. Now, finally, given that the worst of Omicron is behind us, living with the virus also means that we can't simply pour renforcer nos campagnes de vaccination. Il faut continuer à administrer plus de doses de rappel et plus de doses pédiatriques pour que lors de la prochaine vague ou lors du prochain variant, nous soyons mieux préparés et plus résilients. 50 des Canadiens admissibles ont reçu leur dose de rappel. 55% des enfants de 5 à 11 ans ont reçu une première dose. C'est bon, il faut continuer, parce qu'ensemble, nous pouvons y arriver. Je vais maintenant répéter en anglais. Firstly, I would like to address some of the events that have marked the news this week. A few days ago, my colleague Joël Lightbound held a press conference in this very room. I have a considerable level of affection and esteem for my dear friend, Joël. We regularly discuss many issues, including the management of the pandemic, and I have always valued and appreciated his input. In a democracy, it's a healthy habit for everyone to be able to express his or her opinions. Debate and discussion should always be encouraged. We all know people who are eager to be done with the pandemic. And to be honest, we're all eager to be done with, with it. Like Joël, I hear it at home, in Quebec City, and here, certainly, in Ottawa. We also know that in order to get out of the, this phase of COVID, we must continue to work together in a, spirit, in a spirit of benevolence by joining our forces against the virus. This is true for vaccination, it's also true for adherence to all the public health measures that may still be in place. For two years now, our government's actions in the fight against COVID-19 have been based on science and prudence. As we all know, science is continuously evolving, and as we have done since the beginning of the pandemic, we will continue to base our decisions on the best available scientific information and on prudence. Now, let's be clear. The public health restrictions currently in place by provinces and territories in particular were always meant to be temporary. Some of these restrictions will be with us for a long time. Others will be lifted as soon as the epidemiological situation, science and prudence allow it. That said, it's important to keep in mind that these measures are intended to limit the harm caused by the virus. The virus. All measures are subject to constant re-evaluation, and we will continue to adjust them according to science and prudence and the evolution of the epidemiological situation. With the worst of Omicron now behind us, our government is actively reviewing the measures in place at our borders, and we should be able to communicate changes on this next week with the support and the advice of the team of Dr. Tam. We would all like to know for sure what the next few weeks and months have in store for us. But after two years of this pandemic, we know that this virus will always find a way to surprise us. We know that the question is not whether there will be other waves or variants, but rather when. Over the last few days, we have all heard, heard the phrase, we have to live with the virus. We all agree that we have to learn to live with the virus, but concretely, what does it mean to live with the virus? Now, let me humbly suggest a couple of answers to that question, using perhaps a more professorial tone in line with my 
earlier career in 2015 as a professor of economics at Université Laval. Firstly, I would say that living with the virus means that people have to stop dying because of it in such large numbers. Secondly, living with the virus means that the virus in our healthcare system must be able to coexist without the latter being paralyzed. Without cancer patients being told that their surgeries will have to wait because our hospitals and our healthcare workers are overwhelmed by COVID-19. Thirdly, living with the virus means that we must individually and collectively optimize the use, the entire use of our tools in our toolbox at our disposal to limit transmission and the severity of infections. Fourthly, living with the virus also means that we must be honest with each other and recognize that it's not only possible, but very likely that the coming months will hold other unpleasant surprises. Fifthly, living with the virus means that we must remember that we are not powerless in that situation. We have power. We can help ourselves and we must keep helping each other. We have the power to make it so that the public health restrictions imposed by provinces and territories are less severe and disrupt our social life and our, con and our economy as little as possible. Our main tool for that remains still and always vaccination. Even if we know that vaccination is imperfect, the science is unequivocal. Vaccination does reduce transmission and does prevent severe complications. If we can prevent severe complications, our hospitals and healthcare workers will not be overwhelmed. If our hospitals and healthcare workers are not overwhelmed, then in turn, public health restrictions will be less severe. It's obvious, but it's important to remember we have individually and collectively the power to change things. Living with COVID means that we must exercise this power. That's the only way to reduce the impact of the virus on our lives. Finally, now that the worst of Omicron is behind us, living with the virus means that we should not wait for the next variant or the next wave to enhance our vaccination campaigns. We must continue to administer booster doses, pediatric doses, as many as possible, including first, second, and third doses, so that when the next wave or the next variant does come, we are better prepared and more resilient. 50% of all eligible Canadians have received a booster dose. 55% of all children aged 5 to 11 have received a first dose. That's good. We must continue. Together, we can do this. And I'll now turn to Dr. Tam. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Yes, good day, Mes indicateurs d'activité liés à la COVID-19, COVID y compris la possibilité de tests en laboratoire, le RT au taux de réproduction réelle, les tendances de la surveillance des réseaux usés et les cas signés quotidiennement montrent tout ce que le Canada a passé le pic de la vague Omicron. Bien que le nombre moyen de cas à l'échelle nationale au cours des sept derniers jours devient supérieur à 11 000 nouveaux cas signalés quotidiennement, de diminution hebdomadaire en été signalé par toutes les administrations au Canada. Severe illness trends remain high or are still increasing in some areas of the country. However, we are starting to see hopeful signs with weekly reductions reported in most jurisdictions. Compared to last week's update, there are now an average of 1,400 fewer people with COVID-19 being treated in hospitals each day. However, that is still a seven-day average of over 8,700 each day, including over 1,000 in intensive care and 130 deaths were reported daily. As we continue to take measures to mitigate the ongoing impact of COVID-19 on the health system, health authorities across Canada are looking ahead to longer-term sustainable management of the SARS-CoV-2 virus.
This includes transition plans for the immediate future as epidemiologic indicators of COVID-19 disease activity continue to improve. This will allow jurisdictions to begin to ease restrictions. It also includes planning for the months ahead and beyond when we can expect the virus to still be with us, including emergence of new variants with uncertain transmission and severity characteristics. However, what will not change is the advantage to be gained by maintaining a state of readiness. This includes monitoring to detect signals of concern that can enable early and appropriate public health response at the population level. At the same time, providing guidance and tools to support risk-based decision-making can continue to empower individuals, families, and communities to reduce their risk through personal protective practices. À plus long term, nous pouvons nous fier sur les solides assises de protection obtenues par l'entreprise sur l'ébération et la mise en œuvre d'un éventail d'interventions fondées sur la science. C'est utile dans le dépistage, les mesures de santé publique, les vaccins, les vaccinations en clinique et les traitements ont aidé à réduire substantiellement l'incidence et la gravité globale de la pandémie de COVID-19 jusqu'à présent. Et bien qu'une résolution soit possible, surtout avec l'assouplissement des mesures de santé publique, la disponibilité croissante et la mise en œuvre rapide de ces outils peuvent aider à diminuer l'incidence d'un tel cas de figure dans les hôpitaux. En outre, ils peuvent aider à protéger la population plus vulnérable, à limiter le plus possible le besoin d'employer à l'avenir des mesures de restriction généralisées. Wow, this has been a long and difficult journey. There's a lot to be grateful for. Reminding ourselves of how we've kept working together across the country, learned to protect ourselves and each other in the face of uncertainty, and then adapting to changing circumstances is a testament to our resilience. More importantly, it is a perspective we need to feel assured that with continued innovation and creativity, we can successfully adapt and overcome the challenges ahead. Pour le moment, au cours de cette période de transition, il est particulièrement important de réduire la pression sur nos hôpitaux en comblant les lacunes en matière de couverture vaccinale et en maintenant les principales pratiques personnelles de prévention. Plus précisément, des millions de Canadiens admissibles peuvent réduire le risque d'hospitalisation en raison du COVID-19 grave en mettant à jour leur protection vaccinale. Evidence shows that two doses of COVID-19 vaccines offer reasonably good protection against severe disease. And receiving an mRNA booster dose when eligible offers superior protection, keeping more people out of hospital and preventing more deaths. So upon the oncome aucun vaccin n'est efficace à 100% et que l'immunité peut diminuer avec le temps. Continuer à suivre les mesures de prévention individuelle, comme porter un masque de bonne qualité et bien ajusté, éviter les endroits bondés, améliorer les ventilations intérieures de mieux d'importants mesures de réduire les risques aujourd'hui et pour les étapes à venir. Pour les efforts continus d'innombrables Canadiens, je vous dis Thank you. merci. Thank, Thank you. you and Megwidge. Thank you, everyone. Uh, looks like time for questions uh, as, as discussed. We will start in the room. Uh, I'd like to start with Kevin Gallagher, CTV, please. Good morning. My uh, first question is for Health Minister Jean Duclos and also uh, Dr. Theresa Tam can follow up as well. Um, given, uh, given this reevaluation, it seems that's happening ongoing, as you say, for public health measures, and uh, I will lump in their mandates. I, I'd like to ask what data or studies contributed to uh, imposing specifically vaccine mandates in terms of uh, was there any data that showed that this would be a, the best way to increase uptake of vaccinations, especially when we're talking about people who are vaccine hesitant or anti-vax? Obviously, I don't need to 
remark about why I'm asking this question. Ottawa has been occupied uh, by what the mayors call the siege, by people who have strict and staunch views against vaccination and feel that their rights have been violated in some way by mandates. Um, uh, I'm not here to necessarily debate whether the government can put mandates in or not, but I'd like to know if there was any data or studies that backed up the decision to impose them as a way to encourage people to get vaccinated, and if there is any evidence to show that that measure would be useful for people who are already vaccine hesitant or staunchly anti-vax. Well, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, vaccination is not punishment. Uh, vaccination is protection. And in fact, it's, it's a protection that science gave us about a year ago. We had hoped about two years ago that we would eventually be able to have vaccination as protection. That came enormously faster than scientists at that time, about two years ago, thought it would come. And since about a year now, we have had the gift and the fortune of being able to vaccinate Canadians across the country. So it's not punishment, it's protection for the, for the person. When I, I would say I have been vaccinated, I, I receive my booster dose. When I do that, it's because I want to protect myself. But I also do that because I want to protect my family, my parents when I go and, and visit them, my friends when I meet them. And when I see my children be vaccinated, I'm glad for them. I'm also glad for their friends that he will be, or they will be able to, to, to be engaged with. So it's not punishment, it's protection. The second thing is about the protection of vaccination. Dr. Tam might uh, want to summarize the current um, knowledge around uh, biology and immunization. But we know, as she summarized earlier, that although it's not perfect, it's working. But it's working even more with booster doses. And that's the key message, I think, that Canadians uh, would like to hear again today is that a booster dose is, is needed, is useful, is important for all uh, eligible Canadians. And the third thing is that vaccination mandates work. Uh, now, 99% of public servants have done the right thing. They have been vaccinated. Uh, some estimates both within Canada and outside Canada suggest that a large number of Canadians uh, were uh, perhaps better able to understand the value of being protected and to be able to lead a more normal life through a vaccination. There are some estimates that it could be up to 3 million Canadians that over the last six months, because of uh, mandates and, and at the federal and provincial levels, now chose to be vaccinated perhaps quicker and perhaps in, in large numbers. Uh, let's imagine what the situation with Omicron would now be if we had three or up to three million Canadians not vaccinated with the current uh, situation. And finally, and I'll turn to Dr. Tam in a second, the reason for which, an important reason for which we are moving away from the peak of, of Omicron is that a uh, large number of Canadians, not large enough still, about 50% have received a booster dose over the last few weeks. That gave them extra superior protection against Omicron. And in addition to that, uh, that uh, you no know, people have have been making the right choice. You no, know, they they obviously understood that the public health measures were there to protect them. We 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 followed them in, in large numbers, and that's therefore one more reason for which we do have this ability. In addition, obviously, to the natural immunity that has been uh, created through the large uh, incidence and 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 um, in infections of COVID of COVID nineteen, uh, some estimates in Quebec and Ontario suggested it could be up to about 20 to 25 percent of Canadians that have been infected since the start of Omicron in December. So these are large numbers of people either naturally immunized or because of vaccination. And, uh, and I know I'm speaking a bit too much, perhaps I should turn immediately then to uh, Dr. Tam. Thank you. Uh, I won't to add too much on the vaccine mandates, but there's now obvious evidence that they 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 work. And I think in the Canadian context, you can look at it for individual jurisdictions. Uh, but immediately after an announcement uh, of vaccine mandates, and then the uh, actual operationalization of them, there was an uptake. We we saw a plateau in the uptake of. Uh, vaccines after a really tremendous effort by Canadians. 
Uh, and then after the introduction of vaccine mandates by the various provinces and territories and jurisdictions, we did see uh, an, an uptick in that. Could be that can be different between jurisdictions, but there definitely is one. And there's increasing international literature uh, showing that uh, mandates uh, work. But it's not the only tool, and it never has been uh, for us in public health. Building vaccine confidence and trust is the primary um, tool providing uh, the general public with robust information and trusted messages is really key. Providing access to vaccines is really key because many populations have difficulties accessing the vaccines, um, maybe because they work uh, different hours. So getting access was very important. Reducing inequities, helping debunk misinformation is extremely important. And I think vaccine mandates may particularly nudge those who are in the middle trying to figure out whether they'll get it or not uh, has prompted them to actually get vaccinated. Uh, but there was certainly a huge number of Canadians who were very much um, supportive of the evidence-based um, measures, uh, such as vaccination being a really incredible tool. I'll just follow up. Um, you know, my, my question wasn't really about whether uh, I'm, uh, I, I have listened to many of these press conferences and, and have listened to the data about how vaccines are effective. Um, I understand your point about how mandates have increased the vaccination rate in some cases. My question was quite specific about, uh, and maybe I'll just frame it in another way here. What's the plan to reach out to people who are so opposed to vaccination, perhaps basing their information on misinformation, as Dr. Tam just pointed out, that they would be willing to, you know, pretty much put their lives on hold to paralyze the nation's capital. What is the best method to reach out to some people who seemingly don't trust the opinions of Dr. Tam, don't trust your opinion, health minister, um, and have lost faith, frankly, in, in my reporting and other of my colleagues in the mainstream so-called media, right? So what is the, moving forward, is, should there be a different approach or tactic uh, for reaching out to people who are staunchly anti-vax and very much opposed to mandates or vaccinations in general? Well, this is a great question. Uh, I would uh, separate the answers in two parts. First, uh, benevolence, and, and second, uh, trust. I think we, we want to speak benevolently about, the, uh, about vaccination. It's, again, there to protect people. It's not there to punish people. And in speaking about, uh, about that, the, the, the benevolent value of vaccination, the good, because benevolent means you want good, uh, I suppose it's from Latin. Uh, so uh, you want, the, want good for others. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a language that not only unites people, but as you said, brings people forward. Now, on, on trust, uh, I agree that there is a lot of disinformation around all sorts of things, including around the benefits uh, of vaccination. Uh, but I'll turn to Dr. Tam quickly, because PHAC has obviously in collaboration with many, many partners, many of them uh, at the provincial and territorial levels. Uh, PHAC did uh, succeed in providing both the, the benefit, the, the value, the benevolence of vaccination, and also decreasing the disinformation to which you alluded. Dr. Tam, would you like to give a few examples of how PHAC does that? Yes, I think um, recognizing that not everyone listens necessarily to government sources or indeed some um, um, other really incredible expert panels, such as National Advisory Committee on Immunization, we funded a whole range of uh, projects that enable um, other leaders, leaders in the community, elders, um, religious leaders, uh, are supported in the way that they can uh, further support their own communities, Black Canadians um, and other communities who quite frankly, had lots of reasons to be distrustful of government and authorities. They've been brought along uh, to get vaccinated because uh, of the, the trusted voices in their own communities. And that has got us to this far as Canada having one of the best vaccination rates in the world. But there will always be a small percentage of people who will not uh, essentially take up the vaccine uh, no matter what we do. And that has been observed in a multitude of vaccination campaigns. 
And that is probably to be expected that some people will not change their minds. But because so many people, the vast, vast majority of people having been vaccinated, we are able to move forwards in our transition to be able to manage this virus and COVID-19 in a more adaptable and sustainable way. Uh, Before we turn to the next question, I I just should insert one thing. I'm aware that uh, I believe Mr. Duclos may have to leave in about 15 minutes, and uh, we have other questions in the room, but we have some francophone reporters on the the line. I have an obligation to take the questions in the room first, but... If, if if we uh, show a little more vitesse, we might be able to get all uh, questions in both languages. And before you go, thank you. Uh, David Aiken, Global, thank you. David Aiken, Global, and I'm going to stick to uh, English. My other official language is not so good, I'm afraid. Um, uh, question uh, first for Dr. Tam, and then I'd like to hear Minister Duclo. It, through this pandemic, when we've instituted border measures, it's been very clear that one of the goals of any border measure was to reduce or prevent transmission. So, Dr. Tam, to the extent we're testing and tracing, can you tell us and set the stage, what data do we have that any new transmission in Canada is a result of travel? If I could get you to speak to that, and then if you could follow up, Minister, to say, as you consider lifting border measures or changing them next week, are you still worried about transmission from travelers? Just transmission right now at this point. Dr. Tam. Yes, so one of the uh, objectives, particularly when new variants emerge, is to reduce importation risks, which could then lead to transmission. Um, So we do know that the positivity rate, um, as one might expect, with Omicron surge, for example, has led to a very high positivity rate in travelers that we could detect as they come across the border because of the post-arrival testing. Uh, They surged uh, to very high levels um, at the uh, end of December, beginning of January, and then just beginning to come down. But the the positive rates, I'm sure the minister will speak to that, was was actually extremely high. And each one of these individuals can potentially uh, transmit to others, not because they they want to, but because this virus um, is so uh, difficult to manage and can transmit even before someone has has, um, symptoms. So by uh, providing uh, testing, but also the uh, quarantine and isolation measures, that's um, are there to try and reduce that. But we know that that's not a perfect system. And uh, because of the nature of Omicron and how infectious it is, uh, it's very difficult to prevent every case of importation and their onward transmission. Uh, provinces have demonstrated how the initial introduction have spread, of course, first to household members, but then even unbeknownst to them, they've gone to school or work and have transmitted uh, thereafter. But we do have to adapt our border stance because we know it's pretty impossible to reduce every single case of importation. It's already in Canada and it's uh, transmitted widely throughout our communities. But we do still have to look out for other variants and new variants and try and detect them as early as possible and reduce their potential impact, at least to slow the, slow them down so that we can understand them better. Yes, thank you. I may add briefly that uh, we've all learned that uh, the virus uh, spreads through contacts. No, the, the reason for which the virus moves is that people are in contact with each other, and, and traveling is obviously one way uh, through which we may be in contact with others. So the objective is to protect people against the risk of being in contact with other infected people. Uh, uh, Dr. Tam mentioned those statistics that you can find on the web. The PHAC site website is, is, is accessible. If you look at the most recent statistics, you'll see that the uh, positivity rates of travelers entering into Canada in January ranges between 6 and 9%, uh, despite having those travelers showing showing a negative pre-departure uh, test. So 6 to 9% positivity rates among travelers in, entering into Canada. And that's why, as we think thoughtfully, but obviously uh, clearly with the assistance of public health, about the multiple layers of, of uh, measures that we want to have to protect people both 
uh, across the borders and in other ways uh, as well of trains in, in Canada, the public service, as I mentioned. So as we thought, I would think carefully about those multiple layers. The overall objective will always be to protect the safety and the health of people. And uh, we look forward to f further guidance on that. <clears throat> Thank you. And then just to follow up, Minister Duclos, uh, border measures are often implemented sometimes with our international partners, sometimes not. We've coordinated with the Americans, sometimes not. Can you speak to are we being held up by uh, because we need to negotiate with the Americans, say, on cross-border traffic that way? Are we going to act unilaterally? Can you give us a sense of discussions you, you may have had or, or the government may have had with international partners on changing border rules? Well, two, two objectives here, and that's a great question. The first one is obviously to serve Canadians and to protect their health and safety based on the local epidemiological uh, situation in Canada and the national advice on, uh, uh, from, from, our, from, the, from experts. The second objective is obviously to be as much aligned as possible with other partners. But we can never be to totally aligned because, as, you, as we all know, the situation uh, changes. You know, it comes in waves at different times across different places. So these two objectives uh, reinforce each other, always A, protect the safety and, and health of Canadians, and B, do this uh, to the best extent possible with uh, international partners. Uh, Mike um, this is for the ministers, perhaps uh, Minister Duclo, you're in the room, but perhaps Minister LeBlanc. Uh, how will the new Ontario State of Emergency Powers uh, help clear the Ambassador Bridge and end the protest in Ottawa? And why did it take two weeks to see that? What have you been doing in the meantime to get to this point? Well, I'll turn immediately to, do to Minister Leblanc. I don't know if Dominique is a doctor, but he's certainly a minister. And uh, <laughs> Dominique has been extremely engaged uh, with many, and he will, he will indicate in a moment, and will have something to say, I'm sure. Uh, so, merci. Thank you, uh, Jean-Yves. Um, we have been working uh, in a collaborative way with the government of Ontario, with Premier Ford and his ministers, obviously since the beginning uh, of the occupation in Ottawa. The Prime Minister spoke with Premier Ford, I believe, on Wednesday evening. Uh, I spoke with the Premier uh, late last evening on Thursday evening. Uh, he was still at his office working on the details uh, of these emergency uh, measures that he announced this morning. Uh, we think that's a very, very positive step from the government of Ontario. We think that that will uh, help uh, remove the illegal blockades at border crossings that have threatened uh, not only the Canadian economy, but thousands of jobs that depend on that very active cross-border trade. And obviously, we remain very concerned and very engaged on the unacceptable and illegal occupation in the city of Ottawa. I was in Ottawa uh, all this week, uh, and I can understand the frustration uh, of the people who live and work in the city of Ottawa. Uh, we think that the measures that the Ontario government announced, particularly economic measures, punitive economic measures uh, for people who use trucks. Uh, in a way that is uh, illegal and disruptive to public safety uh, and to the economy of the country. Um, we think that this is a, a very, very important and welcome step that the government uh, of Ontario took today. And my discussion with Premier Ford is how we can continue to work with them and support them and their law enforcement authorities in any way possible, uh, because these blockades need to be removed uh, and need to end. Uh, and obviously, the occupation in the city of Ottawa uh, is in the same category. Specifically, does this new power give law enforcement to end these blockades, especially given, I mean, there were calls from the United States government for Canada to do something with the Ambassador Bridge. Isn't that just a little bit embarrassing? What are they specifically are, going to, are they going to do? What is, why is it, and why did it take so long? Well, I think obviously the prime minister, uh, his officials, the national security and intelligence advisor to the prime minister have been in touch with their counterparts in the United States uh, government. There have been obviously conversations with the governor of Michigan as well. Um, so we have been very engaged with our American partners because we share 
their very real frustration with these illegal and unacceptable blockades. Uh, because somebody doesn't agree with a particular public uh, health measure doesn't entitle them to damage hundreds of millions of dollars of cross-border trade or uh, create enormous disruption and abuse uh, on the streets of, of, the, uh, of the nation's capital. Uh, that is not the way to have a thoughtful discussion about evolving public health measures. Um, so we certainly share the frustration that Premier Ford expressed this morning. Uh, this has been an ongoing collaborative effort with the government of Ontario and other provincial governments uh, since the moment these illegal activities began. So what you're seeing now, from our perspective, is a very important series of additional steps that the government of Ontario is putting into place. And as the Prime Minister has said in numerous conversations with uh, provincial counterparts and my federal cabinet colleagues have been obviously in touch with their provincial counterparts, not just in Ontario, but across the country, uh, the government of Canada will be ready uh, to do whatever we can to support local and provincial law enforcement authorities uh, to make sure that these illegal activities come to a conclusion quickly. Hi, uh, Dylan Robertson of the Winnipeg Free Press. Question for Mi Minister Duclos. I wanted to ask about the take-home PCR testing program at the border. We've interviewed rural Manitobans who have had couriers and taxi cabs drive as long as 10 hours to go pick up a single sample. This is likely costing upwards of $1,000 each time. Your department seems to have no issue with this. Is this a prudent use of taxpayer funds? Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, I limit my answer to two things here. We have a, obviously a big country or people live in very different places and sometimes quite far away from urban centers. But everyone has a right to receive the same quality of services. It's the foundation of all the broad health care agenda. The second thing is that uh, given that you know, our suppliers, PHAC suppliers, have been told that they need to do what is needed to do to provide everyone with the the level of service that they need and deserve. And that's for them to decide on the way in which that has to be done. Thank you, Minister. And uh, Minister LeBlanc, the Manitoba government says that your government's tone is making things worse and inflaming things. They argue that the convoy that's blocking Manitoba's main crossing with North Dakota wouldn't be so dramatic if you had a more measured tone. Do you accept that you're making this problem worse for the provinces? I think, as as my colleague uh, Jean-Yves Duclos uh, made clear, the decisions that we make and the measures that we have taken from the beginning of the pandemic have been guided by the best medical and scientific advice uh, that we have available uh, as a government and with international partners. Dr. Tam obviously speaks with her counterparts uh, in other jurisdictions across the country, but uh, around the world as well. So. That has to be the basis uh, for governmental decisions. Um, if a bunch of people are unhappy or disagree with the science uh, or decide that they're not uh, going to follow the best public health advice uh, that they can be given and decide to undertake an illegal blockade of a border crossing like in Emerson, Manitoba, or occupy the downtown core of Ottawa, that doesn't actually constitute medical advice or a clinical trial. Uh, it is a disruptive, illegal practice that harms uh, uh, thousands and thousands of Canadians uh, who want to do the right thing, uh, want to manage the risks of COVID, but want to be able to go to work safely, want to be able to operate uh, small businesses. Um, so the, the tone uh, is also commensurate with the frustration that businesses feel, that residents feel by these continued, continued illegal blockades. So uh, our measures will always be based on the best public policy, scientific and medical advice uh, that, we can, that we can receive. As Jean-Yves Duclos and Dr. Tam said, they will evolve over time as was always understood, based on that advice. Uh, but the government of Canada's job is to 
work with provincial and local law enforcement partners and provincial governments, as we have been doing, obviously, extremely actively uh, to bring these, uh, these illegal blockades to a conclusion as quickly as possible. Okay, I would like to turn to one uh, questions on the phone uh, en français. Julien Lapointe, Radio Canada. Julien Lapointe, Radio Canada. Yes, thank you for responding to my question. Here's what I'd like to know. On what factors, figures, data are you basing your decisions to lift restrictions at the border? What indicates to you today, for example, that we are not ready to lift all those restrictions on travellers that we that we may be ready sooner rather than later? Response. Well, I'll give you a quick answer, and perhaps Dr. Tan can add on to that answer if she sees fit. First, in Canada, we are still in the midst of an Omicron virus crisis. There are over 8,000 Canadians that are hospitalized, which is considerably higher than the average hospitalization rates over the past 23 months in Quebec and elsewhere. So we're not out of the Even though we're doing better in terms of Omicron, we're not doing well, especially across all regions of Canada. Secondly, outside Canada, in some locations, the situation is getting worse. So, as we always do, we will base our decision-making on science and prudence. Science, of course, also, and prudence, well, our key objective is to always protect health and safety. Of Canadians. Finally, we are lucky in Canada to have several layers of border protection which have worked very effectively for the past 23 months. Given that we have several layers of protection, we can play off them in terms of the evolving epidemiological situation in Canada domestically and also abroad, always with the view to protecting the health and safety of Canadians. Dr. Tan, perhaps you'd like to add to that. Oui, euh, je suis d'accord avec euh, yes. M. Duclos parce I agree que c'est une Duclos. combination de, des indicateurs. We're le, talking about a combination of indicators here. Bien sûr, the surtout, epidemiological uh, situation, de, of course, uh, hospitalisation, and especially the uh, hospitalization le rates. Système de, de la santé est, Is the healthcare um, system équipé equipped de, uh, maintenir, to um, Le, 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 le travail, le, le, les autres um, chiffres comme ça. Services, Mais aussi, um, on a maintenant to uh, un bon niveau de couverture vaccinaire, surtout uh, avec le deux doses. Mais aussi, um, immunité uh, dans given la population that most augmentée par le, le vaccin, aussi, uh, les sanctions, Canadians, uh, primarily due to vaccination, um, but also le, Omicron, previous le virus, infections. Uh, um, Omicron, uh, uh, infected beaucoup de gens infected dans many Canadians. De, de l'immunité Consequently, uh, dans la the herd elevée. immunity Maintenant, in the Canadian population uh, is a tad uh, higher than it was dit, previously. Uh, Furthermore, as the minister indicated, uh, the, it's aussi. the epidemiological uh, current state of le, affairs le worldwide. En général, est en train de diminuer. However, Mais il y a beaucoup de pays où Omicron est commencé d'infecter la population ici. However, Omicron has just started to infect en, local en, populations. En In other countries, the wave is coming to an end. D'accord. Et question pour le ministre du Clos, euh, votre question, ami, ministre collègue, Duclos, le député Lightbound, mais aussi les conservateurs Joel demandent de Lightbound, présenter un échéancier de la levée des, des restrictions pour venir où on s'en va avec tout ça. Est-ce que vous seriez d'accord de présenter so un échéancier comme ça et comme l'on fait seulement déjà d'autres provinces? Are you provinces? in agreement that we need such a timetable oui, and are the provinces si going to do so in territories in collaboration with you? Response. But I'd like to start by saying there's great news in terms of vaccination. For example, Today, there are about 10,000 Canadians over the age of 12 who will be receiving their first dose. There are 6,000 children today who will be receiving their first dose of the vaccine. Probably about 150,000 Canadians who today 
vont recevoir une dose de rappel. Donc, les, la vaccination progresse. Et ça, ça aide, comme vous l'avez entendu, de la Dr. Tam, ça aide à renforcer notre capacité immunologique et donc notre capacité de protection contre le virus par rapport à ce qu'on avait en décembre dernier. On met sur la question de la de la COVID-19. Ce que les conservateurs Now, demandent essentiellement, c'est au gouvernement de déclarer qu'à une certaine date, il n'y aura plus de COVID-19. C'est pas au gouvernement, certainement pas un ministre de la Santé, qui va pouvoir déclarer qu'à partir d'une certaine date, la COVID-19 va être disparue. La science ne fonctionne pas comme ça et le virus non plus. Donc on va toujours continuer de faire ce qu'on a toujours fait, c'est-à-dire d'ajuster le plan qu'on a depuis 22 mois pour protéger la santé et la sécurité de tout le monde. On va toujours le faire de manière responsable en utilisant les avis scientifiques de la santé publique et le principe de prudence, parce que la COVID nous a réservé toujours plein de surprises et il va y en avoir d'autres dans les prochains mois, peut-être même dans les prochaines années. Je sais que nous avons encore deux autres questions, incluant Stéphane Blais avec la presse canadienne. Est-ce que c'est possible d'avoir une autre question? Monsieur Is it Blais. possible to field another question? Yes, Mr. Blais, please go ahead. Ah, vous m'entendez maintenant? You can hear me, I trust? Oui, absolument. Si yes, vous m'entendez, oui. oui. Je voulais savoir, avez-vous des Good. données concernant la transmission euh, du virus par des camionneurs transfrontaliers et est-ce que l'obligation vaccinale des camionneurs est importante au point de mettre en jeu la sécurité des citoyens et la paix sociale? Merci What about from pour la question. À nouveau, la vaccination, ce n'est pas une punition, c'est une Once protection. Again, et quand on choisit de se faire vacciner, comme je pense à tout, When ceux à qui je parle, et certainement ici dans la salle, on choisit de le faire. Quand on choisit de se faire vacciner, c'est pour se protéger soi-même, mais c'est aussi pour protéger les gens avec lesquels on est en contact. Ça peut être des proches, ça peut être des membres de famille, ça peut être des amis, ça peut être aussi des collègues de travail. Et c'est pour ça que cette mesure est toujours une mesure de bienveillance. C'est pour pouvoir prendre soin de soi-même et aussi de prendre soin des gens avec lesquels on est en contact. Ça s'applique pour l'ensemble des gens et c'est vrai pour tous ceux qui traversent la frontière. Et c'est d'ailleurs comme on fait symétrique avec les mesures de santé publique et de vaccination des États-Unis. Ceci étant dit, on va toujours réévaluer la situation, mais pour l'instant, la, 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 la règle de la même, c'est que si on veut éviter les restrictions, les confinements, les fermetures d'écoles, les fermetures d'entreprises, euh, si on veut éviter qu'on voit là, les, les, les problèmes autour de bon, les, les théâtres qui sont fermés, les, les, les cinémas qui sont fermés, qui vont, sont en train d'ouvrir, heureusement, dans la plupart des endroits au pays. Si on veut faire ça, éviter les restrictions et les confinements, ben, c'est la vaccination qui demeure notre outil euh, essentiel. Remain our best bet. Mais avez-vous des données sur la transmission du virus par les camionneurs transfrontaliers? Je vais me tourner vers le Dr. Tan. Et ce que je veux, ce que je veux vous dire à nouveau, c'est que quand les gens se déplacent, et c'est vrai autour de la frontière, évidemment, mais les contacts sont plus fréquents. C'est ce qu'on entend de la santé publique, puis c'est ce que, intuitivement, on comprend aussi. Et ce qu'on entend aussi du milieu de l'industrie du transport, c'est que la grande majorité des entreprises qui se sont prononcés et des représentants de ces entreprises et des travailleurs sont en faveur de la vaccination obligatoire parce que ça non seulement protège leurs travailleurs, mais ça protège les entreprises, ça protège les chaînes d'approvisionnement. Ce qu'on a vu au cours des derniers jours et des dernières semaines, ce sont des rapports de représentants de l'industrie qui disaient que le problème, ce n'est pas la vaccination, le problème, c'est l'absentéisme, c'est la maladie des, 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 des camionneurs. C'est le fait que beaucoup de camionneurs au cours des dernières semaines ils se sont trouvés malades, ont dû s'absenter. En plus de ça, quand ils sont en contact avec d'autres collègues, ça peut être des, des mécaniciens, ça peut être des livreurs, ça peut être des gens avec lesquels ils sont en contact. Mais les contacts, évidemment, favorisent la transmission du virus. Et ça, ça fragilise non seulement les chaînes d'approvisionnement, mais ça fragilise évidemment les entreprises. Et ça met évidemment là, en jeu la santé des camionneurs dont on a absolument besoin pour poursuivre la relance économique. Right, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Oui, comme euh, beaucoup de Canadiens, il y a beaucoup de well, travailleurs essentiels yes. qui sont infectés par le virus. L'Omicron, le variant Omicron, dans les dernières semaines. Donc, c'est pas les camionneurs ne sont pas différents. C'est la même population. On n'a pas de chiffres. Selon les occupations, we don't have a breakdown euh, of the figures based on uh, C'est pas euh, dans notre base de données not, uh, pour le texte. One of the euh, donc, euh, c'est dans la province de notre territoire euh, où euh, les cas sont euh, suivis par, par les, 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 les administrations. Infections uh, local. and cases Not by local jurisdictions. Uh, so donner. I don't have those figures at hand, unfortunately. I'm, I'm told uh, Mr. Duclos may have to leave. I, I'd just like to stress that we have questions from Globe and Mail and CBC left here on the line. It would be great if the others have time to take them. Uh, I can. Okay. I'm happy to stay for about another five minutes. I okay. uh, was told it was over at 12:30, but I could stay for five more minutes. Okay, we will. I'll. 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 I'll try one more. We'll see how fast we can squeeze. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, let's try. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We may have one. David Thurton, CBC. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, Dr. Tam, what is our new vaccination goal now that there are boosters? Um, is there a new specific goal that we're trying to hit here? As many people as possible uh, is the goal. And I've said it even for two doses, is shoot for the stars. There's no specific uh, levels, but you want it to be really high, particularly for the high risk groups. Um, I actually think that the uh, for the older age groups, which are some of our highest risks, the uh, booster rates are pretty good. Uh, but there are still some seniors, particularly those over the age of 60, um, who still haven't got their booster dose. It's really important that they do because the booster actually really increase your um, protection against severe outcomes. It can actually also reduce your um, risk of Uh, getting infected for a period of time as well, which can be uh, important during an actual wave. Uh, but the durability and the quality of the immune response against severe outcomes uh, is augmented for sure by the booster dose. For the younger population, they, there is a gap at the moment. And again, whether it's for the personal protection or for making sure that uh, we have a health system, healthcare system that's sustainable for all, for all illnesses. Um, it's a great idea for everybody to get their boosters when they're eligible. So, so does that mean that our goal is, you know, 100% vaccination? And if that's the case, that would be the ceiling. But what's the floor of that goal? What's the minimum you think we're trying to achieve here? Um, our goal overall in Canada's uh, pandemic response to re is to reduce severe outcomes, morbidity, mortality, and um, while um, you know balancing that against societal disruption and business continuity and everything can be maintained better if people were vaccinated. Um, so I can't really answer your your question because it's really as high as possible for for uh, a while. I mean. Our, our goals and our science evolved over time, as you all know. We've been bringing you all along with um, uh, news conferences throughout the past year. Um, and we've had the vaccine now for just over a year. Um, there, there were certainly some initial goalposts um, in terms of getting first and second doses in, um, in order to achieve a good level of individual and population immunity. But what we know is that we can't get rid of this virus. It is going to stay with us. There may not be such a thing as herd immunity. This is a term that I have not used for a very long time. Um, but any vaccination level can help population levels of immunity. Um, and we've just got a boost of uh, that immunity as well from those who did get infected, at least against the Omicron virus. We don't know where the virus is going to evolve. That's the other thing. 
that changes your vaccination goalposts as well. So we have to keep monitoring the evolution of the virus. Do we need to change the vaccine? What will we need, need to do in the fall? So these are all the different scientific questions and planning that we need to do moving forwards as we adapt to the longer term management of COVID-19. Uh, Rika Walsh, Golden Mail. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to clarify um, on the border. Um, just first of all, on, on the fact that we still have an, an international sweeping travel advisory in place, including for vaccinated travelers. One of the complaints that we've seen from protesters is that, um, you know, we're sending hundreds of Olympians to the Olympics in China. Meantime, the message to the average citizen is that it's too dangerous to travel. Can you tell me if the travel advisory still makes sense and how you explain that disconnect to the average person watching your press conferences? So shall I start, Ms. LeBlanc? No, so go, go ahead, Dr. Tam, go ahead. Yeah, so um, as with everything that's evolving, we are actively examining uh, the advice for travelers. Uh, we've never stopped people from leaving Canada, but um, the current global um, advisory, travel advisory is avoid non-essential travel. Uh, it doesn't stop any individuals from doing so, but it is a um, really important uh, message when Omicron has been surging and still continues to surge throughout the world. But we are actively examining that as we uh, are doing for um, other public health measures. Mr. LeBlanc, can you weigh in on that question, please, before I ask my follow-up? Sure, Marika. I think uh, my colleague Jean-Yves uh, Duclos indicated at the beginning uh, of his comments that we would uh, have more to say, we hope, next week uh, on the normal evolution of measures uh, at our borders. Dr. Tam just, I think, repeated what we've been saying uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, that we put in place the best measures possible based on the best medical and scientific advice we have, uh, and they change as the circumstances or the virus changes. Um, so I think we may have more to say uh, next week uh, based again on, on that advice and those discussions. I chair the federal uh, cabinet COVID committee. We're constantly discussing examples of of border measures that are appropriate based on the context of the virus at this particular time. So uh, I, I would think, uh, Marika, you may have the chance uh, to see us again next week with some uh, precisions on our border postures. Okay, thank you. And Mr. LeBlanc, um, we're seeing a lot of sort of back and forth and finger pointing between Ontario and the federal government with federal sources suggesting Ontario was a laggard in imposing these emergency measures, the Ontario government's pushing back on the record. Uh, why does this finger pointing serve um, Ontarians who have voted for both your governments and who, um, you know, both your governments are accountable to? And can you please set the record straight? Did Ontario refuse to act on the emergency measures earlier this week, and are they late in imposing them now? So, Marika, thank you. Uh, as I said, I think uh, some moments ago, we uh, view very positively the measures that the Ford government announced earlier today. Uh, the Prime Minister has spoken with uh, Premier Ford uh, a number of times, as recently as a day and a half ago, uh, late last evening. I had a detailed conversation myself, again, with Premier Ford uh, that was very constructive and collaborative. We uh, and officials, senior officials from uh, my department and the Public Safety Department, the RCMP commissioner with the OPP commissioner, the deputy minister of transport, our minister of transport. Um, Marika, these are ongoing, active and very frequent exchanges. Uh, as to what can we do collaboratively together uh, to bring these illegal blockades uh, and occupations uh, to an end as quickly as possible. So 
the province properly has a number of jurisdictional uh, tools that they can bring to bear uh, on this illegal activity. Uh, the federal government has some law enforcement resources that we will obviously make available to any reasonable request from local or provincial law enforcement authorities. Uh, there are federal intelligence agencies collaborating uh, with their provincial and local partners. Uh, so I have participated in numerous conversations many times a day, as have my cabinet colleagues and the prime minister himself, uh, with our officials and with our counterparts in Ontario, uh, particularly, but not exclusively in Ontario, with the governments in Alberta, for example, and other provinces who are understandably concerned about similar activities that are unacceptable. So we'll continue to do that work. Um, and we view it, frankly, as essential that every jurisdiction bring to bear the maximum uh, pressure they can to end these illegal blockades and occupations that uh, are causing such understandable concern uh, in communities across the country. We'll do everything we can. And today, the government of Ontario uh, took what we think is a very, very important step that we hope uh, will contribute to a rapid conclusion of uh, the blockades at the borders and the unacceptable occupation of the streets of Ottawa. Alors, c'est tous nos questions pour aujourd'hui. Uh, all, all the all questions, the questions we have today, today. I just like say thank you for going into overtime with us today. Uh, unless you have a, a final uh, comment, thank you. Merci, miigwech.